Uh, good afternoon. Again, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Confield for this fantastic symposium. When he first called me, I thought there'll be 20 people at a symposium, but I was stunned to see <laughs> 200 people plus. Wow, this is amazing. Uh, so 50 years ago marked the first publication of this entity known as BPD. And uh, personally, that year was significant for me because I was born that year. So you can say I've been following the progress of BPD very closely. So these are some of my uh, disclosures. Uh, really want to focus on uh, this uh, NHLBI-funded project or Stop BPD, signature of top omic profiles in BPD. Some of the data in this presentation comes from that. The lung map project focuses on the mechanisms underlying normal lung development. Uh, for if you don't understand how the normal lung develops, how are we going to understand what happens during abnormal lung development or BPD? And PREVENT, which is a new UO1 project, uh, focuses on control of breathing. Again, on how this control of breathing is associated with abnormal long-term respiratory outcomes such as uh, BPD. So this is the overview of the project, what are biomarkers and why we need them, the past, the present, and the future. Uh, we are not going to discuss the omic profiling in detail because we don't have enough time, but I will be touching briefly upon the genomics, microbiome, the mitochondriomics, and microRNA. So what is a biomarker? That's a characteristic that is measured and evaluated as an indicator of normal biologic processes, pathogenic processes, or pharmacological responses to a therapeutic intervention. So it's not just pathogenesis, but it can indicate what biomarkers of normal development or of therapeutic response. And this can be any clinical feature, radiologic feature, or laboratory-based test marker. So it doesn't necessarily need to be a blood sample for a cytokine, it can be any clinical feature or even a radiographic feature. So why do we need them? So biomarkers may be useful for earlier diagnosis. It may en enable initiation of therapies when they are more effective. For example, in the window of opportunity. If you wait too long, you may miss the window of opportunities and uh, you may not be optimizing your therapy. Also, non-detection of risk for BPD may enable avoidance of therapies and their potential hazards. If an infant is at lower risk, you can potentially hold off starting a therapy, and you might have a lower risk uh, of a bad outcome. Prediction of disease severity, prognosis, or endotypes. So you could use targeted therapies for infants at higher risk, for example, specific endotype. If you know an infant with BPD is going to develop pulmonary hypertension, that might be the infant to target for nitric oxide, not giving it to everyone. Also, monitoring disease processes and response to therapy so that you can adjust the therapy as uh, the disease progresses. For example, uh, B-type natriuretic peptide might be a marker of uh, pulmonary hypertension severity. You could follow that as you're monitoring uh, uh, BPD with pulmonary hypertension. And it could give us some possible insight into underlying disease mechanisms, and we'll discuss that uh, briefly. So the past. So until recently, People use clinical variables, such as birth weight, gestational age, the magnitude of respiratory support, uh, various markers in the blood, which often indicated uh, included uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines, such as IL-8, IL-1-beta, IL-6, and so forth, or uh, markers in the tracheal aspirate, such as, uh, again, the same cytokines, or in the exhaled breath, such as entitled CO or nitric oxide, uh, lung function indicators, uh, urinary uh, markers of oxidative stress or uh, uh, the bombesin-like peptide, or uh, imaging, for example, depending upon the magnitude of uh, severity of uh, X-ray findings on the, or on the CT or MRI, or echocardiographic findings of uh, pulmonary hypertension. Let's look at how these biomarkers are related to the pathogenesis. Uh, this is just a simplified schematic, uh, for example, hyperoxia and ventilator-associated lung injury acting on an immature lung with surfactant deficiency uh, leads to bronchopulmonary dysplasia. So we could have biomarkers which are associated with hyperoxic injury, we could have biomarkers that are associated with ventilator-associated lung injury, and you could have biomarkers uh, which are associated with the magnitude of immaturity or with the magnitude of surfactant deficiency. And of course, those which are associated with the severity of uh, BPD. But we now know that it's not just a simple uh, schematic anymore. We think in terms of disease networks. 
uh, which makes things a bit more complex. So we have the disease-modifying genes such as uh, cytokine and immune immunity response genes, the surfactant genes, various developmental genes regard, uh, which are associated with lung development and lung vascular development, which interact with the environmental determinants which are responsible for center effects. As you all know, center effects lead to very marked changes in BPD uh, rates across centers, such as uh, the rates of volutrauma, the amounts of infection, uh, the magnitude of impaired nutrition, as well as hyperoxia-induced lung injury. And all these lead to uh, effects on the immature lung, which leads to intermediate phenotypes of inflammation, apoptosis, atelectasis, and so forth, which in turn lead to the pathophenotypes, inhibition of lung development, abnormal lung vascular development, resulting in long-term impairment of lung function. Now, some of these genomic factors might also directly affect uh, lung function. Uh, so, it's quite complex and you have to remember that biomarkers can uh, be modified based on the genomic factors, depending upon the environmental factors. There could be specific markers associated with infection, for example, a higher CRP or other markers of infection. Markers associated with inflammation or apoptosis, again markers in the tracheal aspirate which indicate a higher level of apoptosis and markers of abnormal lung vascular development like Dr. Abman was mentioning earlier. It's important to remember that these operational definitions such as BPD do not capture the phenotypic and the genetic heterogeneity which underlies pathogenesis. I usually say it this way, that all normal lungs are similar, but every abnormal lung is abnormal in its own way. And we try to lump everything into one box and say this is BPD, but then we uh, do not see the amount of heterogeneity that's present in this uh, diagnosis. So the magnitude of parenchymal versus vascular versus airway abnormality determines these different endotypes and the associated biomarkers for these endotypes, which are all different. So we could have variation in the biomarkers with the source of the uh, biomarker. For example, we have different biomarkers in the bronchialveolar lavage or tracheal aspirate versus plasma versus urine. Often we find that the same biomarker is increased in the BIL and decreased in the plasma or vice versa and the nature of the biomarker too. For example, we know that uh, if you do uh, combined RNA sequencing and proteomic analysis, the amount of overlap between mRNA and protein is only about 20%. That is 80% of the time there is no correlation at all between mRNA and protein. You may have an increase in protein with no change in mRNA or an increase in mRNA with no change in protein. The postnatal age, for example, if you think about cytokines in the plasma, or in the whole blood, they often show a biphasic kind of response. Pro-inflammatory cytokines increase over the first few days, then they decrease down to day 7, and then by day 14 they go up again. So this kind of biphasic response is often seen with postnatal uh, cytokines. So if depending upon the age at which you sample the infant, you would have varying levels of uh, biomarkers. Gestational age too, some of them uh, decrease with gestational age, some of them increase. So you've got to take that into account. And of course, you've got to take into account the clinical events that are associated. And obviously with endotype, if you have more pulmonary hypertension, you may have a separate uh, pattern of biomarkers. In previous times, uh, we used to think that DNA just acted as a template for the production of uh, messenger RNA, which then led to the uh, a lining up of multiple amino acids to form a peptide chain which then got folded to form a protein. Um, but it's not quite so simple because we know that uh, from DNA you have not just mRNA but you have microRNA and other small RNA such as pvRNA and snow RNA. There's link RNA or long non-coding RNA which in turn regulate DNA through DNA methylation, which in turn regulate uh, the amounts of protein, both by post-transcriptional, uh, post-translational mechanisms, as well as by alternate uh, splicing. And all these in turn uh, regulate the, uh, the metabolome or the final common uh, small molecules that uh, often exert significant biologic influences. And that's without even taking into account the microbiome. So we mm -hmm. always think in terms of the human uh, cell, but we are only a small fraction of the total number of cells that are present in us. There are far more microbial cells in our body and on our body than human cells. And 
Naturally, we have biomarkers related to DNA, genomic markers, transcriptomic markers, proteomic biomarkers, uh, the microRNA profile, the link RNA profile, the metabolomic profile, and so on. And these could be organelle specific. For example, if you look at mitochondria, they might be having a different kind of pattern as compared to the endoplasmic reticulum. And there is also cell type specificity. Endothelial cells often respond very differently from epithelial cells, from fibroblasts, from mesenchymal stem cells. And as we saw in the recent uh, talks by Dr. Christina Alvira, there are cell-cell interactions, uh, which may be mediated by exosomes, by shed microparticles or shed microvesicles, as well as by mechanotransduction, like uh, the by Dr. Bland uh, earlier this morning, when you have mechanical ventilation which causes uh, shear stress and uh, uh, lung injury. So let's briefly discuss the genomics of BPD. Uh, twin studies suggest that genetic factors account for about uh, 53 to 65 percent of the variance in liability for BPD, but targeted evaluation of SNPs uh, indicate uh, roles for SNPs and surfactant proteins, toll-like receptors, cytokines, antioxidants, and so on. But most of these have been from small studies and have not been validated. There have been three uh, genome-wide analysis by Hatchwell, which uh, indicated SPOC2 was important, but that wasn't uh, validated in the other studies by Wong and uh, in the neonatal network study. And uh, our study in the neonatal network did identify some pathways, though, which we will discuss. Uh, it seems to be that most of BPD may be uh, related to variations which are rare and of uncommon. Uh, so you would probably need to do whole exome sequencing or whole genome sequencing to get a better idea of which specific uh, mutations are associated with disease in a particular infant. But what I wanted to show you was that when you look at any BPD or death that is uh, at 36 weeks, that's basically moderate to severe BPD, that's this yellow circle on the left, whereas severe BPD or death uh, is up here this pink circle and this light blue circle is below severe BPD in survivors. You see there is very little overlap between the two. So the genomic predictors of moderate BPD are very different from those for very severe BPD. So severe and moderate BPD are very different at the genomic uh, level. And I know you can't read this easily, but this is basically to tell you that the pathways that are important are very different when you consider all infants together versus black infants versus white infants. So there are marked differences by ancestry. So when you put everyone together, you get a very different set of predictors. When you look at uh, uh, different uh, an ancestry groups, you see very different uh, results. So from this study, we identified that there are large differences in the genetic background of severe versus moderate BPD, and there are marked differences by ancestry as well. One of the other things we have become interested in recently is the microbiome, and this is uh, Dr. Vivek Lal, one of our junior faculty who I'm helping mentor. And this study on the airway microbiome at birth was published last year in Scientific Reports. And uh, just as background, uh, the lower airways are not sterile in adults. So you and I have about 2,000 bacterial genomes per square centimeter of uh, airway surface. And there's a characteristic microbial flora which differs between health and disease. In most of us, even though we are breathing in room air which has a lot of oxygen, the normal flora consists of anaerobes such as bacteroiditis, which are difficult to culture. And proteobacteria are strongly associated with airway disease such as with COPD or asthma. So the questions we wanted to answer was, what's the airway microbiome at birth in that preterm and term infants, and how is this different from the preterm infants who develop BPD? So this is uh, a kind of area plot of uh, infants at term, extremely low birth weight infants at birth, and extremely low birth weight infants who have developed BPD. And each of these colors represent a different phylum. So the dark blue is a proteobacteria, and this kind of brown orange is uh, uh, firmicutes. So uh, it's important to see that whether you're extremely low birth weight or whether you're term, you have a very diverse microbiome. So there are tons of bacterial DNA in the airway, even at the time of birth, whether you're a term baby or a preterm baby. But then by the time you become an infant with uh, BPD, uh, this uh, graph you see down at the bottom uh, right shows the Shannon diversity index, which shows a reduction in bacterial diversity in infants who develop BPD. Uh, 
And this is a sequential analysis of some of the infants who develop BPD. You can see that there are multiple phyla on day one or the first week of life. And then with a progressive uh, increase in uh, postnatal age, uh, you see an increase in the blue, which is the proteobacteria. So there is an increasing replacement of the normal flora by proteobacteria in the infants who go on to develop uh, BPD. So can you actually predict which infants are going to develop BPD by looking at their uh, airway microbiome? So we have uh, one cohort of infants from uh, UAB uh, who we defined as BPD resistant who did not develop BPD and another cohort of infants who are BPD predisposed, that is those who develop BPD. And the two statistically significant phyla were firmicutes which included staphylococci and firmicutes which included uh, lactobacilli. So staph were increased and lactobacilli were decreased in the infants who uh, uh, developed uh, BPD. And then we used a different cohort of infants from uh, Philadelphia, uh, from my collaborator Vineet Bandari. So in this validation cohort, uh, we validated that uh, there was a reduction of lactobacilli in the infants who uh, uh, developed uh, BPD. So this is just uh, looking at lactobacilli alone. Uh, this green uh, bar is the ones who are BPD resistant and the red ones who are BPD uh, predisposed. So there's a reduction in lactobacilli both in the discovery cohort as well as in the validation cohort. So you could say that this is a biomarker of BPD as early as day one. So if you have a reduction in lactobacilli, you're uh, more likely to develop a BPD. And uh, the converse is also true. If you have more proteobacteria, and actually we also measured endotoxin, if you have more uh, bacterial endotoxin, you're more likely to develop BPD. So from this, uh, we can say there's a complex microbial community at birth, and uh, at birth, it's similar in both the preterm and term infants. BPD-resistant infants have more lactobacilli DNA, and we have some new data which indicate that the airway microbiome is derived from the placenta, and it doesn't resemble the gut microbiome. So the gut has a very different microbiome in the, in the newborn infant and the fetus. Uh, the uh, airway microbiome is quite uh, separate. So the question is, why does this happen? Uh, we suspect that pre-exposure of the fetus to microbial DNA may lead to priming of the immune system, or it might uh, help establishment of a commensal relationship. The other area uh, of uh, biomarkers that I thought was really uh, important to mention here is that about mitochondrial function. And uh, the, the person who's been leading this effort is uh, Dr. Jagan Kandasamy, one of our junior faculty in our uh, division. And uh, we always think of mitochondria as just the powerhouse of the cell, just making ATP and that's it. Uh, but they do a lot of other things too. So bioenergetic assays are basically measures of oxygen uh, consumption rate by the uh, mitochondria. They indicate mitochondrial functional integrity. And they're not only cellular oxygen sensors, but they also produce reactive oxygen species in a tightly regulated manner. And they uh, scavenge re uh, reactive oxygen species and reduce uh, oxidant-induced uh, damage. So this is... Uh, uh, this is uh, a, a graph of uh, a graph of wonder why that's happening. Okay, but uh, basically you can see that there are two. Well, I don't know why that keeps doing, but uh, basically there's a marked difference in oxygen consumption uh, rate between uh, infants who develop BPD or not. Uh, the ones in red are the ones who are uh, uh, no BPD or death, and the ones who are in blue are the ones who die or develop BPD, and that's a big difference. <laughs> okay, well, I'll just skip that. Uh, if you look at the amount of superoxide which is being produced, again, the infants who uh, die or develop BPD have a higher superoxide production, as well as a higher amount of uh, hydrogen peroxide uh, production. And uh, there's also a lot more uh, mitochondrial DNA damage in the infants who go on to uh, die or develop BPD. So we have a difference not just in mitochondrial bioenergetics, but also in the amount of reactive oxygen species they produce and the amount of mitochondrial DNA damage. And these are from human umbilical vein endothelial cells, which have been isolated at the time of birth, obviously from the umbilical cord of these infants. And we uh, did these experiments within the first three passages, so from fresh, uh, freshly isolated endothelial cells. And we are able to predict outcomes which happened uh, probably about uh, 
10 to 12 weeks uh, later. And we have done some modeling of these, which showed that the area under the curve is uh, almost 0.9, so it's a pretty good predictor, just using the mitochondrial bioenergetics. And if we do a, a classification and regression tree, uh, again, the highest uh, uh, variable, or the ones which, are, which is most strongly associated with outcome, is the maximal oxygen consumption rate. So overall, the rate of BPD is about 0.5, and uh, it's hard to see. I think it's moved a bit. The formatting has changed. But if the maximal oxygen consumption rate is uh, more than 200, none of the infants develop BPD, whereas if it was less than 200, the rate of BPD or death was uh, 74%. And the uh, gestational age and birth weight are lower down on the classification tree, indicating that they're less uh, important predictors. Uh, the microRNA profile, uh, again, we have done uh, a discovery cohort and a validation cohort. In the discovery cohort, we did a nanostring profiling of about 800 microRNA in a cohort of uh, infants who were either did not develop BPD or who later developed BPD. And all this was using um, exosomal microRNA from the tracheal aspirate. So we collected the tracheal aspirates, did differential centrifugation for uh, uh, exosomes, and sometimes we use these. Uh, um, Exicon kits to isolate the exosomes. And we identified about 20 different microRNA that were uh, significantly different. And we validated them in a different cohort of infants, and we found uh, that about six of them uh, were indeed different. And we selected the one which had the highest fold change, which was MIR 876-3P, for further uh, uh, evaluation. And just MIR 876-3P uh, had an AUC of 0.92. And uh, that's a quite a high uh, predictive value for just a single uh, variable at a time of uh, birth. Uh, this manuscript is under revision. Hopefully, it will be accepted uh, soon. And we have done some work in mice. This is the only mouse slide I'm going to show you, but uh, just to show you that uh, in the LPS with hyperoxia model, so these uh, mice are pretty severely affected in terms of alveolar development. If you give a mimic for mir 876 3 p you're able to improve lung development uh, quite uh, markedly. And that's the radial alveolar count you see over there with uh, the LPS with hyperoxia reducing RAC by almost 50%, which is almost fully restored with the uh, mimic 876 3P. What about chorioamnionitis in all this? So as I mentioned earlier, the microbiome is altered by uh, chorioamnionitis. Uh, if there is chorio, there's a reduction in lactobacilli. And there is also uh, a change in mitochondrial function. So the black bars are the ones with chorio, the white bars without chorio. So there's a reduction in um, basal as well as maximal oxygen consumption rate with, uh, uh, with chorioamnionitis. So, uh, how do you put all these data together? So, I would uh, think this is a kind of a simplified schematic because I'm not including the proteomic or metabolomic or other data or the DNA methylation data, but uh, it appears that chorioamnionitis might induce uh, dysbiosis or alteration in the airway microbiome, either a reduction in lactobacilli or an increase in proteobacteria, which then act on lung cells uh, and uh, induce mitochondrial alterations, such as a reduction in uh, basal and uh, maximal oxygen uh, consumption rate. And it also induces uh, the release of uh, exosomes with a different cargo, increases in some microRNA, decreases in other uh, cargo. And all these, to, uh, in turn, lead to uh, the BPD phenotype through multiple uh, mechanisms. Uh, the next few minutes, I will briefly describe what's going on in the present and then uh, indicate what we can do in the future. So the STOP BPD project, or signature of top omic profiles, uh, it will involve about 300 infants uh, at UAB, 150 in the development cohort, and 150 in the validation cohort. And all these are extremely low birth with infants who are being sampled in the first three days of life for blood, urine, and a tracheal aspirate. And we use the blood for both RNA and DNA for mRNA as well as microRNA profiling, the DNA for genomic profiling, and the plasma protein and urine protein for proteomics, and the microbiome from the tracheal aspirates. And we would integrate all the data from uh, all these different uh, omic analysis to get a, a predicting model. The important thing about this study is that it's not just looking at BPD or no BPD, but we look 
we are going to look at indicators of susceptibility or resilience. So we are going to use the NHS Neonatal Research Network BPD uh, calculator. So if you go to the website, you can plug in the gestational age, birth weight, uh, sex, and race ethnicity, and the amount of respiratory support. And you can actually find out what the probability of severe BPD, death, moderate BPD, or mild BPD, or no BPD for a specific infant is. And then from that, we can identify if these infants have severe BPD or death or no BPD, whether that's discordant or concordant. Uh, what I mean by that is uh, if we uh, run the analysis in the, uh, in the website and we have uh, an overall predicted death or severe BPD rate of, say, 79%, and the infant does not develop BPD, we would call that no BPD discordant. That is, this infant was predicted to be at high risk but did not develop BPD. So this BPD is no BPD discordant or is resilient. Or you take another infant, for example, the second infant in this group, a 28 weeker who is uh, 1350 grams, uh, black, uh, male, who is on SIMB with a rate of uh, FIO2 of 0.23, has a very low rate predicted death, 0.8%, predicted severe BPD, 2.7%. So a predicted death of BPD is only 3.5%, but this infant develops severe BPD, so this infant is severe BPD discordant. So this is an infant who is susceptible. So we are going to be primarily comparing the resilient versus susceptible infants, as well as comparing them to those who are concordant for both severe BPD or mild BPD. That is, you're predicting to develop severe BPD and they do develop severe BPD, or you're predicting no BPD and they don't develop uh, BPD. These are some of the preliminary results looking at the susceptible versus resilient infants. Uh, we have done microRNA profiling on some of the validation cohort. Uh, we have done proteomic profiling and we have done uh, uh, transcriptomic profiling by AmpliSeq. Anyway, uh, out of 2,400 microRNA and PVRNA, uh, there were only 20 of them which were uh, statistically significant. Uh, these are just the top five of them. And they all seem to have uh, very interesting targets. For example, 46, 45 targets interleukin-33, which is, again, a uh, key uh, molecule involved with mast cells and asthma, uh, ligand co-repressor or LCOR, uh, which is, again, uh, regulated by estrogen receptor, uh, new regulin-1, again, a key developmental molecule, uh, 545G is another interesting microRNA, targets HMGA2, surfactant protein C, TGF beta receptor 3, and so on, which we know is important in lung development and lung injury. So it seems that some of these targets are really uh, interesting, uh, but we have to do further validation in the validation cohort. That's still pending. The other study we're involved in is the PREVENT project, uh, which is another EO1 project, in which we are using high-resolution cardiorespiratory data and developing mathematical models to not only predict hypoxemic and bradycardic episodes, that's the apneic episodes, in individual infants before they occur, but also to identify the patterns of ventilatory abnormalities associated with BPD. So it's not just what's going on with the lungs, but also what's wrong with the control of breathing and how that affects uh, respiratory outcomes. So right now we have developed some mathematical models that is able to predict bradycardia before it happens with uh, very high accuracy. So the blue line is the actual heart rate and the red line is a predicted heart rate and you can see very close uh, overlap. So we're able to predict this apnea and bradycardia accurately even before it happens. Uh, we are thinking of developing a device which will alert the nurse before it actually happens in the infant. Um, but the question is, can we predict long-term outcomes? Can we predict uh, three-month outcomes? Uh, and uh, are we able to predict it uh, with sufficient accuracy? So what about the future? So I think the future, as many people have mentioned earlier, is uh, personalized medicine in which we are going to integrate uh, clinical data, which involves somebody actually laying on of hands and feeling what the infant is uh, doing, uh, feeling perfusion, uh, hearing the uh, breath sounds. Uh, clinical informatics, such as the high resolution physiological data, as well as uh, data from the monitors, as well as from the ventilator, and bioinformatics, such as biomarkers, uh, which could be done not just uh, collecting and processing at a distant facility a week later or a month later, but uh, preferably using point-of-care kind of testing, such as like doing a blood gas. If you can use a small drop of blood and measure multiple analytes at a point-of-care testing, that would be optimal. So you could use uh, targeting and following therapy, 
for specific uh, endotypes. The second thing I think we need to do is uh, develop a clinical and research infrastructure that's integrated, similar to the children's oncology group. Uh, we have almost 60,000 very low birth weight infants per year in the US with very wide center variations in outcome. Uh, we know a lot about uh, patient characteristics and outcome, but not a lot about what we are actually doing to them. Um, if we are able to develop a biorepository even in a small fraction of these infants, combining clinical data, biosamples, then we really would be able to advance the field. And uh, finally, I think we need to focus on biomarkers of longer term outcomes, especially adult uh, lung functions and risk of COPD or pulmonary hypertension in adults. Because while BPD is an important cause of morbidity in the infant, what we really want to be uh, uh, focusing on is how these infants do later. How are we going to measure alveolar growth? Is it DLCO or some other measurement? How are we going to measure vascular growth other than with echocardiogram? Is there any way to actually measure the amount of microvasculature or normal vasculature versus dysmorphic vasculature? And airway function, is FEV1 or FEF25 to 75 the best uh, indicator? So in conclusion, uh, BPD is a complex multifactorial disorder, and our operational definitions such as BPD do not capture the phenotypic and genetic heterogeneity. An unbiased evaluation of biomarkers may help early diagnosis, uh, prognosis, following response to therapy, and may occasionally yield insight into the underlying disease mechanisms. And uh, a better understanding of an individual's phenotype, genotype, and these multiple omic biomarkers may suggest potential uh, personalized uh, interventions. Uh, thank you. <laughs>